Well, hey, everybody, I'm Adam Shell, the pastor at Melbourne Heights, and I want to welcome you as we come together to worship online today. And today we are continuing on in our sermon series called Following the Way, where we're talking about how we can follow the way of Jesus in everything that we do. And that means more than just the churchy areas in our lives. Today we're specifically going to be thinking about how we can follow Jesus when it comes to our relationship with money. And I want to go ahead and let you know now that we're not going to be talking about money in any of the stereotypical ways that you're afraid the church will talk about money. Instead, what we want to do today is help you to take control of your finances and to change your relationship with money forever. But before we get into all of that, I want to encourage you to engage with us throughout our time together today. You can do that if you're joining us on Facebook or on YouTube by sharing this post right now and inviting your friends to come and worship with us and to come and worship with you today. You can also use the comments threads that you find on Facebook and YouTube to have a conversation with us. We would love to talk with you, so feel free to make your comments or ask any questions that you may have. And if you're joining us on Facebook, make sure that you use those emojis to let us know when you like something that was said, if you love one of our songs, or if something that we do today makes you laugh or think a little bit different. And yes, using the comments thread and the emojis is not ever going to be the same as worshiping God together in person, but when we see all of these things and when we use these tools, we are worshiping God together as one body, one people united in one faith. So please use those and engage with us throughout our time together today. Now in just a minute, I'm going to turn it over to Leslie and our instrumentalists as they lead us in worship through song. But first, let me invite you to join me in a word of prayer. So let's pray together. God, as we come to you in this time of prayer, we just thank you. We thank you for the chance that we have to come together online right now to worship you today, God. And my prayer is that as we come together to worship you, God, that you let us focus in on you and that you let us hear a word from you during our time together today. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship. Let's praise the Lord together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
So to start the new year here at Malvern Heights, we have been talking about how we can follow Jesus all year long. But we're not doing this the way that we typically do in church. Typically, when we talk about following Jesus at church, we talk about following Jesus in the churchy areas of our lives. So that means that we'll talk about following Jesus when it comes to our worship service or our small groups or when we're reading our Bibles or saying our prayers. But what we've been trying to remind you of throughout the sermon series is that Jesus isn't just the Lord over the churchy stuff in our lives. Jesus is Lord over every area of our lives. Jesus is Lord over every area of our lives. So we want to talk about how we can follow Jesus in every area of our lives. And we're doing that by taking a closer look at some of the main areas of our lives that we all tend to focus in on at the beginning of a new year. And we've seen over the last couple of weeks that the areas of our lives that we tend to focus in on at the beginning of a new year are related to our health, which we talked about last week, or they're related to how we spend our free time, which is what we're going to talk about next week, or they're related to our finances, which is what we're going to be talking about today. That's right. Today, we are talking about everybody's favorite topic in church, and that's money. Okay. I'm just kidding. Nobody really likes it when we talk about money in church. And there's a really good reason for that. That reason is that the church doesn't exactly have a great reputation when it comes to money. I mean, let's face it right here. Just about every single one of you that's tuned into the service right now, you have run across a video on late night TV or when you're scrolling through YouTube of some revival service out there somewhere where the preacher who always seems to be wearing a gaudy suit with his hair slicked straight back, promises that if you'll become a ministry partner and make a small donation of a mere $19.99, that he will send you a special appreciation gift of a genuine splinter from the actual cross where Jesus was crucified. And you don't have to worry if this splinter is the real deal or if it's really just a piece of Ikea furniture that they ran through the wood chipper because it comes with its own certificate of authenticity that was signed by the Apostle Paul himself and notarized by none other than Moses. Okay, maybe you haven't actually seen a so-called minister that is quite that brazen, but the truth is, you don't have to look very hard to find a preacher out there somewhere who promises that if you will sow your financial seed into his or into her ministry, that God will let you reap a seven or a ten or even a hundredfold yield for the investment that you've sown. But the reality is that the only one who ever ends up getting rich off of that lie is the guy in the video who's selling it. So here's the deal. Today we are going to be talking about money. But I don't want to talk about money in any of the stereotypical ways that we associate with the church. So I won't promise that I'm going to send you a splinter from the cross during today's sermon or any other sermon. And I won't talk about the financial harvest that God wants you to reap during this sermon or any others. And I won't ask you to sow your financial seed into the ministry of Melbourne Heights. Today, we aren't even going to put up the slide that shows you where to go on our church's website if you want to financially support the work and the ministry that we're doing. And that's because this sermon, this sermon isn't about the church's finances. This sermon is about your finances. And if you're like most Americans, your financial picture isn't a very pretty one. Let me give you some statistics to show you what I mean. In November of last year, it was reported that consumer debt in the United States of America had surpassed $14.27 trillion. Now, consumer debt consists of personal debts that are owed as a result of purchasing goods that are used for individual or for household consumption. And what that definition tells us is that consumer debt includes things like credit card debt and student loan payments and car payments and even your mortgage. And we as Americans have over $14 trillion worth of it. That's trillion with a T. And I know, I know that that number is way too big for any of us to really comprehend. So let me break that number down for you a little bit more. Americans owe over $14 trillion, and there are roughly 330 million Americans. So for us to have $14 trillion of consumer debt, that means the average American has $40,000 of debt. And that's per person. 
So the typical family of three would be $120,000 in debt, or the typical family of five would be over $200,000 in debt. And what does that debt actually look like for us? Well, the average credit card balance in America today is a little over $1,600. But here's the kicker for you. The average American has four credit cards. So the average American has over $6,000 of credit card debt. And that's just credit cards. Let's take a second right now and talk about how much money we owe on our cars. Out of our $14 trillion worth of consumer debt, car loans make up $1.34 trillion of it. That's roughly 10%. And here's what that looks like for the typical person. For the typical person who bought a brand new car the last time that you were out on a car lot, your monthly payment is $568. And if you bought a used car the last go round, then your monthly payment is $397. And that's every month. And the typical term for an auto loan is 63 months, which means that the average American is paying between 400 and 600 bucks for their car every month for more than five years. And by the time that we make the payments that we owe on our credit cards and on our cars and on our student loans and on our houses every month, most of us don't have much money left over to save. What that means is that half of all Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And the surprising thing is that that number doesn't change too drastically based on our income either. One out of every three people that's earning between $50,000 and $100,000 a year, and 25% of people who earn over $150,000 a year report that they are still living paycheck to paycheck. And what that means is that if the average American had an emergency that cost them over $1,000, like making a trip to the emergency room or having their car break down, 59% of us would have to borrow that money from a credit card company, from a bank, or from a friend. But financial experts recommend that we all have enough money saved up in an emergency fund to cover three to six months worth of our expenses. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us that the average household spends roughly $3,500 a month just on the essentials. And when I say essentials, I'm talking about things like housing and food and healthcare and transportation. So the typical American family should have an emergency fund of $21,000, but 59% of us don't even have a thousand bucks in a savings account. Now I know, I know that I just threw a whole bunch of numbers and a whole bunch of statistics out at you. And I'm sure that it was more than a little overwhelming, but I want you to know that I did it for a reason. I want you to understand that we as Americans, we don't have the best relationship with our money. And that all came to a head last year as the coronavirus pandemic began to spread. Remember, most Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. So when 36 and a half million people lost their jobs last spring, many of them didn't have anything to fall back on. And even though our economy has started to bounce back over the last few months, there are still over 20 million Americans that are drawing some form of unemployment benefits today. And so without the government stepping in and increasing those unemployment benefits and sending out stimulus checks, there are a whole lot of people who would be flat broke right now, or even worse, bankrupt. But that's not what God wants for our finances. Now, don't get me wrong here. I am not telling you that God wants to make you rich. I think one of America's most prominent speakers and pastors, Rick Warren, actually explained this really well in an interview that he did for Time Magazine a few years back. Here's what Rick Warren said. He said, this idea that God wants everybody to be wealthy, there's a word for that, baloney. It's creating a false idol. You don't measure your self-worth by your net worth. I can show you millions of follow followers of Christ who live in poverty. So why isn't everyone in the church a millionaire? So God may not want to make you rich, but God also doesn't want you to be broke. God may not want to make you rich, but God also doesn't want you to be broke. God wants you to be able to provide for yourself and for your family. The Apostle Paul, 
who was the foremost missionary and theologian of the first century. He makes this clear for us in a letter that he writes to a young pastor by the name of Timothy that Paul is mentoring in his ministry. Now, when Paul writes this letter, there are a lot of ministers living in a town called Ephesus who have come up with their own rules about what it means to follow Jesus. So Paul sits down and he writes this letter to Timothy to try to straighten things out for him. Paul wants Timothy to know what it really looks like to follow Jesus. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, this is what Paul writes to Timothy. Paul writes, If someone doesn't provide for their own family, and especially for a member of their household, they have denied the faith. They are worse than those who have no faith. So it's clear from this verse that God expects us as followers of Jesus to be able to provide for ourselves and for our families. But I want you to notice what Paul doesn't say in this passage. Paul doesn't say in this passage that God is like our own personal ATM. And Paul doesn't say that God is going to rain money down from the heavens on us whenever we need it. Instead, what Paul is alluding to in this passage is that we have to be responsible with our money so that we can take care of ourselves and so that we can take care of our families. So that's what I really want to talk about today. I want to talk about how each of us can be responsible with our money. But before we can talk about how each of us can be responsible with our money, I have a confession that I have to make. And that's that I haven't always been very responsible with my own money. As a matter of fact, at the beginning of 2015, just six years ago, my family was up to our eyeballs in debt. We had just bought a new home a couple of years earlier, so we had a great big 30-year mortgage that was hanging over our heads. We had also bought a couple of brand new cars within the last three years, so we still owed around $30,000 on those two cars. And we were slowly paying down our balance on a Home Depot credit card that we opened up so that we could put down some new flooring in that house that we had bought a couple of years before. And what all of that means is that every single month, we had to write a check out to our bank for over $1,000 for our mortgage payment. What that means is that every single month, we were paying Toyota around $750 for our two cars. And what that means is that every single month, we were throwing whatever money we had left and any extra money that we could find at that Home Depot card, just trying to make that thing go away. And that all amounted to about $2,000 a month coming out of our pockets before we spent a dime on anything else. So that meant that my family was living paycheck to paycheck, like half of all Americans. But in 2015, we decided that it was time to get serious about our finances. And within two months, we had paid off our Home Depot card. Within nine months, we had paid off my car. And just over a year later, we had paid off my wife's car. All total, we paid off over $30,000 in consumer debt in just over a year. And because of that, we've been able to build up an emergency fund since then. Because of that, we've been able to start building up our retirement accounts since then. Because of that, we've been able to start a college fund for our daughter. And because of that, we won't be paying a mortgage for 30 years. The truth is that that mortgage will be paid off long before 2043 ever rolls around. And here's the thing. I'm not telling you all of this because I want to brag about myself or about my family. I'm telling you this because I want you to know that no matter what your finances look like right now, you can take responsibility for them and you can change your relationship with money. I mean, I'm a minister and my wife is a teacher, so it's not like we have a huge extravagant income. And when we started to change our relationship with money, we were in worse shape than the average American family. Remember what I told you earlier. I told you earlier that the average American family or the average American is $40,000 in debt. So my little family of three, we should have been $120,000 in debt, but we were closer to $200,000 in debt. So let me tell you, 
Let me tell you the biggest secret to our success. Let me tell you the most important thing that we did and that you can do to take responsibility for your finances and to change your relationship with money once and for all. And it all comes down to one word, budget. And I know that some of you think that I just told you that you need to go and rent a car, and that's probably why a whole lot of us are in trouble financially. But a budget is really just a plan that you make for your money. And the idea of budgeting, it's a biblical concept. When Jesus talks with the crowd around him about what it means to be one of his disciples, Jesus, he uses a budgeting example. In Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 30, this is what Jesus says. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Building a tower, it takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of resources. And so does building a healthy financial life. And whether you want to build a literal tower or you just want to make sure that you're able to take care of yourself and to take care of your family, you need to have a plan for your money. You need to have a plan for your money. That means you need to have a budget. Let me say that again for you. You need to have a budget. Now, I'll be honest with you. There are a lot of different approaches to making a budget. So when it comes to budgeting, you need to find what approach is going to work best for you. Because a budget is never going to work if you don't actually use it. So don't be afraid to spend a little bit of time Googling how to make a budget. And then try out a couple of different approaches until you find the one that's right for you. But for me, the approach that I prefer to budgeting is called a zero-based budget. And the goal of a zero-based budget is that when you subtract your expenses from your income each month, that it will equal zero. But that doesn't mean that you have zero dollars sitting in your bank account either. So let me give you an example here to kind of show you what I mean. When you're making a zero-based budget, the first thing that you need to do is to write down your income. So step one, write down your income. So for the example we're going to use today, let's pretend that you bring home $3,000 a month. That's your income, $3,000. Write that down. Now, the next thing that you need to do is that you, you need to write down your expenses, starting with the essentials. Step two, write down your expenses, starting with the essentials. And the essentials are shelter, utilities, and transportation. So let's say that you spend $1,000 a month on your rent or your mortgage. Let's say that you spend $500 a month on your groceries or on eating out. And let's say that you spend $200 a month on your electric and your water bill and another $200 on your cell phone and your internet service. And let's say that you spend 100 bucks a month on gas. So when you sit down and you add up all of those expenses, you get $2,000. So when you subtract $2,000 from $3,000, you still have $1,000 left over that you need to budget for. And now's the point where you need to think ahead a little bit because some of the expenses that you have are occasional expenses instead of being monthly expenses. So you're going to have to pay your vehicle registration at some point during the year, and you'll have to pay property taxes and maybe even HOA fees or something else. So if your vehicle registration runs $200 and your property taxes are another $800 and your HOA fees cost you 200 bucks, then you need to set aside another $100 a month to make sure that you can cover these expenses when they come up. So in this example, you would still have $900 left over that you need to budget for. So the next thing you need to do is to set your financial priorities. Step three, set your financial priorities. Now, the Bible makes it clear that one of our financial priorities should be giving. That's why it tells us in places like Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16, don't forget to do good and to share what you have because God is pleased with these kinds of sacrifices. And it's also why the Bible talks so much about taking care of the orphan and the widow and the prisoner. God wants us to use our finances to help other people. God wants us to use our finances to help other people.
So as you make a budget, I encourage you to make giving a priority in your budget. But giving isn't your only priority. If you're in debt, you need to get out of debt as quickly as you possibly can. So you need to throw a good chunk of that 900 bucks that's left over in our pretend budget at paying down your debt. But make sure that you still have a little bit of money set aside so that you can have some fun with it, because budgeting is a whole lot like dieting in this way. If you can't have a donut or an ice cream cone from time to time, you probably aren't going to stick to your diet. And if you can't have some fun with your money, then you're never going to stick to a budget. But once you find yourself out of debt, your financial priorities, they get to change. When you're debt-free, you can start focusing on saving money and building up your emergency fund. Then you can focus on building up that retirement account and even helping pay for your kid's education and focus in on giving even more. So let's go back to our example. With the $900 that we had left over, let's say we make giving a priority and we follow the biblical principle of tithing and give $300 to help other people out, whether we give that to our church, another nonprofit, or something else. So now we have $600 left. And out of that $600, we want to make sure that we have a couple of hundred bucks that are going to cover things like our entertainment and our clothing and some miscellaneous expenses. And then we're going to throw the other $400 that we have at paying down our debt. And when you do the math, you'll find that your monthly income is $3,000 and your monthly expenses are $3,000. So now you have a zero-based budget. Now I know. I know that I covered a whole lot of information in the last couple of minutes. So if you missed any of it, or if you need a little clarification, there are a couple of things that you can do. First, remember this is a video, so you can go back and rewind it and watch what you need to. But if you need a, little, need a little bit more help, reach out to me. Call our church office, send us a message on Facebook, or just leave a message in the comments thread to let me know that you need a little bit more help. And if you do, I promise that I'll work with you until you've got it figured out and you're ready to start making and following your own budget. And once you have it figured out, once you take control of your money, I've got to tell you, it's an incredible feeling. The financial expert and the radio personality, Dave Ramsey, describes it well when he calls it financial peace. Having control of your money will give you a sense of peace that I can't explain to you. You have to experience it for yourself. But I can tell you that it is the kind of peace that God wants you to have in your life. But it's up to you. You're the one who has to do it. But if you're willing to commit and you're willing to work on it, you can change your relationship with money once and for all. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the time that we've had together during this service today to think about what you want for our lives and for our money, God. And the reality is that in spite of the way that many of us live day to day, God, you don't want us to be broke. You want us to have financial security. You want us to be able to afford to take care of ourselves and to take care of our families, God. So my prayer today is that anyone who needs to hear this message has an open heart and mind to receive it, God, and that you challenge them to take the steps that are necessary to change their relationship with money once and for all, God. I also pray that you use our church as, as a tool that people can turn to when they're having financial struggles, God, that we're a place that can help people make it through difficult times. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, at this point in the service, we usually put up a slide on the screen to tell you how you can financially support our church. But I told you that today was going to be a little bit different. And instead of telling you how you can give to our church, I actually want to tell you about something that our church wants to give to you. If you are serious about making the commitment to change your finances once and for all, we want to help you out. And we have a gift that we're willing to give you if you will stop by our church. We have a book that's called The Total Money Makeover that's provided by Dave Ramsey. Again, Dave Ramsey is a radio personality and a financial guru who has helped millions of people change your relationship with money once and for all. And inside of this book, he will give you step-by-step -step instructions about how you can get out of debt and take control of your money once and for all. So if we can help you out with that, we would love for you to stop by our church offices. We're at 11001 Bluegrass Parkway, suite number 330 here in Louisville. We'd love to have you stop by and pick up a copy of it. Now let me turn it back over to Leslie and our musician as they lead us in our closing song.
we go, I just want to take a second to thank you for joining us for worship today. It means so much to us that you spent part of your day with us. And if you've been blessed by our time together, let me ask you to do a couple of things before we go. The first thing I want to ask you to do if you're joining us on Facebook or on YouTube is to share this post and invite your friends to come and watch a replay of the service. Also, if you're joining us on Facebook right now, make sure that you like our page. And if you're on YouTube, subscribe to our channel so that you know whenever we have a new video posted. I also want to take just a second to remind you that we are serious about doing what we can to help you if your goal this year is to take control of your finances once and for all. So we've got quite a few copies of this book around our church offices that we would love to pass out to you, but you do have to stop by our church offices to make that happen. Again, our address is 11001. Bluegrass Parkway, Suite 330. We would love to help you out there. Also, remember, if you haven't done so yet, that we are having people fill out Connect cards so that we can stay in touch with you throughout this new year. You can find that by visiting our church website at mhbclouisville.com, and then the Connect card link is right at the top. Now, that's all that I've got for us today, so let's join together once again in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Let's pray together. God, we do thank you again for the chance that we've had to be together and to worship you, God. And we thank you for the fact that you care about every area and every aspect of our lives, God. And God, you know how many people across our country and around our world are struggling with finances, God. So my prayer is that anyone that hears this message today, God, that needs to hear it will follow it, God, that they'll do what, what you want us to do to take control of our finances for once and for all, God. And God, my prayer is that you continue to use our church to minister to people in every area and every aspect of our lives. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's it for today. I hope that you guys have a great week, and we will see you back here for another time of worship next Sunday.